Hi y'all, um, I hope you're doing well and taking care of yourselves. To keep you away from boredom in this presentation, I will introduce to you the inactive approach as illustrated by Di Polo and Ivan Thompson's article from 2014. To understand the article though, I think it would be useful to first zoom out a little and briefly go through the history and influences that gave rise to the framework as well as its core concepts. So it's difficult to put everything in a 15 minute presentation, but luckily we have already laid down the history of cognitive science in the previous presentations. In the time the inactive approach was formulated, the representational and computational view of thinking about cognition had been well established. Um, and that was supported by the large technological search happening at the time, especially the advances seen in AI and machine learning. However, a lot of other concepts were emerging and being attended to as well. Living systems were starting to be looked at as the autonomous systems that bring forward their own cognitive domains, a view nurtured by concepts drawn from complexity theory, emergentism, and dynamical systems. In 1972, Maturana and Varela published a book called Autopoiesis and Cognition, which introduced the concept of autopoiesis referring to a system being capable of reproducing and maintaining itself, uh, which was already explained by Consti. So in the Principles of Biological Autonomy, Varela elaborated on the concept of autonomy in biological systems. Then afterwards, in the Tree of Knowledge, written by Maturana and Varela and published in 1987, uh, the term inactive was proposed to evoke the view that when it comes to knowledge, what is known is brought forth. It's not just passively out there which naturally is in contraposition with the more classical views of cognitivism or connectionism. These insights, together with the emerging view on embodied cognition, Mario Ponti's phenomenology of the lived body, and the Buddhist philosophical idea of dependent origination, specifically in the Madhyayama version, according to which cognition and its objects are mutually dependent, led to the publishing of what is regarded as the seminal book for the inactive approach, the embodied mind. Essentially, inactivism provides a middle ground between the two extremes of representationalism and solipsism. From there on, the inactive approach took on and has been embraced by many researchers in different domains. So what is the inactive approach about and why is it seen as the middle way? I believe a quote borrowed by the poet Antonio Machado by Varela uh, to explain what an action is beautifully captures its essence. Wanderer, your footsteps are the roads and nothing else. You lay down a path in walking. What this means is that for an activist, cognition is a process of dynamic sensor motor coupling with the environment, which brings forth a custom tailored agent dependent world. Most of us are familiar with this figure. It was introduced in a paper by Froze in an attempt to explain the core of concepts of inactivism. And I don't know about you, but I find it rather confusing, which is contradictory to the simplicity and elegance of the main ideas of the inactive approach. In fact, it's probably due to the simplicity that it took us quite a while to acknowledge it, as it is with more things that are right in front of us. So before going to the article, I'd like to clear up the main pillars of the inactive approach. For this, I found the second chapter of An Action Towards a New Paradigm for Cognitive Science. You can find the reference at the end of the presentation. Uh, extremely helpful. In short, the inactive approach holds in its core five concepts. Let's briefly break them down. So firstly, a living system is autonomous. It builds and maintains uh, itself at some level of identity. This, of course, is a process constrained through the needs of the system and what the environment offers. These needs exchanges, these needed exchanges with the environment can either be beneficial for the organism, they can be neutral, or they can be detrimental. Such normativity is generated through the process of sense making. Therefore, sense is not an invariant, it comes to be through the dialogue between the system and the environment. We already got familiarized with the next concept central to the inactive approach, emergence. To recap, something is emergent and not just an aggregate of dynamical elements when it has its own autonomic identity and the process of sustaining this identity leads to constraints and changes in the underlying levels. To understand the concepts, synthetic models can come very much in handy as human cognition is not really suited to working on that scale of interaction. Next comes embodiment, which we look at from different stances. 
in this seminar session. Embodiment can be applied to many things and exactly this issue is discussed in Dipolo Thompson's paper. So we'll come to it in a bit. But in short, for an activism, without the body, there is no cognition, as the body is the beginning, the means, and the end of sense-making. And finally, something that really differentiates the inactive approach from more traditional approaches is that experience is central not just on the theoretical level, but also methodologically. Thus, an ongoing dialogue is constituted between phenomenology and science. Naturally, this includes the scientist's experience and therefore contains an element of personal practice. Okay, so now that we've hopefully cleared things up, we can move on to the article. The article is part of a book that discusses different aspects of embodiment. As you may have noticed, people are using this term in many different contexts and this makes its meaning quite fuzzy. Generally, what's agreed upon is that uh, the main embodiment thesis is that the body is crucial for cognition. However, depending on who you ask, you'll get very different answers to the questions what they mean by body and cognition and what is meant by the body to be crucial for cognition. In the article written by DiPolo and Thompson, they aim to clear up these questions in the context of the inactive approach and by explaining why this approach is a much needed alternative to more traditional views on cognition. The way this was addressed was by focusing on the tightly interlinked notion of autonomy. So to recap, as we discussed above, an essential attribute of the body is that it's self-individuating, meaning that despite the ever-changing environmental and internal conditions, it generates and maintains itself. One well, can argue that this holds true on many different scales, from individual cells to the immune system, through what you call me, to whole societies. And this is absolutely true. The active approach is not in contradiction with this observation. The borders one puts to individuate a system depend on the conventional criteria used to do so. And yet, this is not purely arbitrary. The body, like all given systems, can distinguish itself from others. So in this context, where are the borders between cognitive and non-cognitive agents? The answer can be found in the concept of autonomy. I think that many of us associate the concept of autopoiesis with the inactive approach in this border. Well, autopoiesis can be seen as a subtype of autonomy. So system can be autonomous without being autopoietic, but the opposite doesn't hold. And for system to be autonomous, it should be operationally closed and precarious. What does it mean for a system to be operationally closed? It certainly doesn't mean that it's shut off from the world. Stating that it is, is against the main pillars of the inactive approach and it's also intuitively unlikely. Every dynamical living system interacts with the environment in some way or another. And it nonetheless maintains itself in this process of change. So operational closure represents a network of meta-enabling relations, which creates an interdependence of both internal and external processes. You can see this illustrated by the figure, which is also part of the paper. The um, black um, figures can be seen as internal processes, while the gray ones are external. And yet these enabling relations depend on circumstances. They are observed only when one chooses to observe them. Thus, operational closure can be missed if the focus is placed elsewhere. But it is there when observed at the right level. Operational closure, however, is not enough for a system to be non-trivially autonomous. It also should deal with precariousness. The term expresses the constant decay of the system. This is not a positive property of the process, but rather an unavoidable aspect of materiality. It explains the inherent restlessness resulting from its efforts to sustain itself despite it. This process, however, requires interaction with the environment, which is a source of energy, matter, and vital relations or information. This also explains the spontaneity uh, exhibited by such systems, since they need to buy time. The body itself can be seen as such an autonomous system. The previously described interaction naturally requires regulation of operationally closed processes with respect to continued identity, something known as adaptivity. And for adaptivity to work, there must be some kind of normativity, 
Since some interactions with the environment are good for the maintained identity, others are bad and third are neutral. The generation of this normativity is known as sense making. Taking all together, the inactive approach views basic cognition as a matter of establishing relevance and normativity um, as means of maintaining an identity in a precarious environment. Precarious? I don't know how it's pronounced. Okay. Um, this process is not only mediated through the body, though. It happens because of the body. As nicely said by Di Paolo, Roth, and De Jäger, mind is possible because a body is always a decaying body. This, of course, is in contrast with the view that cognition is a matter of representation uh, of states of affairs. But it's not necessarily denying that this also happens. The inactive approach just says that there is a more basic form of cognition, which is governed by sense making and presupposes the more narrow, high level problem solving processes, which may or may not entail representations. All right, hopefully we all agreed that all of this makes sense. How can it be proven? Well, this is where models come in handy. One can construct models of autonomous systems that can enable exploring the implications of this concept. Of course, a model itself is not an autonomous system. It's a simplification of one, but it can help study certain properties. This is uh, what, for example, Egbert and colleagues have done, where they made a series of dynamical systems models of autonomy in the context of bacterial behavior. By modeling bacterial chemotaxis behavior as a cycle of autocatalytic reactions far away from a thermodynamic equilibrium, they managed to model some aspects of a precarious operational closure and empirically observed behaviors of bacteria, uh, which were also seen in real life bacteria. This shows the deep link between metabolism and behavior a relation governed by autonomy and sense-making. Such models can be extended and used to study further the evolutionary implications of the basic link between life and mind. This, of course, is still quite basic. What about things like imagination, thinking, and understanding others? Well, at least when it comes to the social domain, the inactive framework has proven itself very useful. There, the concept of participatory sense-making, called um, attention to the participatory and non-individualistic processes that play a crucial role in social interaction, as opposed to traditional approaches where social understanding is reduced to inferences and simulations. This is something that we discussed at length in the previous introduction to cognitive science seminar. As you may recall, the approach has many empirical implications in psychology and neuroscience, like hyperscanning and second-person methodologies. And it offers the possibility of a truly social cognitive science, which gives a fresh and more holistic take on development, psychiatric disorders, and social interaction in general. But actually, that's not all. For it is important to remember that the inactive approach is yet to be coherently developed and extended. And doing so is especially important given how differently it can be interpreted. At this point, it is elusive to say that the inactive approach is just an explanation of basic cognition and that other frameworks can be used to explain more complex behaviors. And it will remain so until it is elucidated in what other domains it is useful, how much we can explain with it, and how we can translate the theory into practice. Perhaps some of us will do exactly so with their seminar papers. Right, to sum up, let's go back to the three questions we asked in the beginning. According to the inactive approach, a body is an adaptively autonomous and therefore sense-making system. In its most general form, cognition is sense-making. And well, um, what is sense-making? It is the body process of adaptive regulation of states and interactions by an agent with respect to consequences for its own viability. Hence, without a body, there is no sense making. Well, this is the inactive approach in a nutshell. I hope that this presentation cleared up the main concepts, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Since I'm no specialist, however, I would also recommend looking into some literature. Here are the sources that I found extremely useful and I have cited in the presentation. Thank you for your attention and take care.